Okay, uh, let's get started. I'll introduce myself. I'm Art Kramer. I'll be here for another two weeks. I've enjoyed my time here. Uh, I got here in 1979 as a graduate student and never thought I'd still be here, but I think many of the faculty can can speak to this issue of coming to Illinois and, and uh, for what they think is a brief period of time, either as an assistant professor or a postdoc or a graduate student and learning it's a pretty great place to be. And I've, I've enjoyed my 37 years here and, and uh, look forward to coming back and saying hello. I will keep some research going here. But uh, what I'm gonna tell you about today is uh, the Beckman Institute and where we're at and what we've done and where we're going. And uh, questions are always welcome. So I did want to introduce, for those of you that don't know, uh, he couldn't be here today, but Jeff Moore, who's a long-term Beckman faculty member uh, and a member of the Department of Chemistry, will be the interim director uh, starting April 23rd, I believe. And uh, Jeff has had administrative experience. He was interim department chair for the Department of Chemistry for a year, and he's been at uh, Beckman for a long time. I think it's 17 years or so, or maybe longer. Uh, but uh, he and Nancy Sotos and uh, Scott White have been running the Autonomous Materials or Self-Healing Materials group for many years. So they are a staple. Uh, Jeff is a very nice man, a uh, very smart man, and I think he'll do a great job. And he's got the right temperament, I think. So, uh, so I think he'll be a, a, a great interim director. So let me move on from, here's Jeff, if you don't know. And, and he's younger than I am, so we should always go for younger folks. <laughs> Or at least he looks younger, I'm pretty sure he is. I'm pretty sure. Okay, so uh, what do we have here? To tell you a little bit about where we're at, and of course this fluctuates over the years, but uh, we have probably the largest number of faculty members we've ever had, and we'll break that, I'll break that down in a minute. Uh, and from a very, very diverse uh, part of the university, 52 departments, not certainly all of them, but, but many departments uh, representing 12 colleges. It doesn't say that here, but we also have a number of faculty members and, and uh, researchers from Carl, uh, and more and more all the time, and that's a good thing since Carl and the University of Illinois are, are merging for the, for the purposes of the medical school and will administer it together uh, in terms of the instruction and so forth. Uh, a substantial part of which, I bet, will happen here at the Beckman Institute given the kinds of resources we have, the centralized facilities, uh, there aren't any other human MRI machines on campus, lots of microscopy and lots of other things, but also a lot of faculty members who would be relevant to what the students will be learning. A good number of graduate students and undergraduates, uh, many postdocs, uh, our administrative staff, I'm sure Governor Rauner would say, cut it in half, or maybe cut it by two thirds, I don't know. Uh, but uh, our staff is great, by the way, and if you don't know it, uh, I encourage you to, uh, to introduce yourself if you haven't met them. Uh, and I know we have a great staff for a lot of reasons, and one of the main reasons is many other departments, including the department we report to, that is the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research, often, I think I'd call it steals away our, our staff because they are so good at what they do. Uh, number of publications last year, not, not too bad, and, and almost as many media mentions. So our, our uh, PR department, our, uh, our uh, group led by Maeve does a great job, as does the university of getting information out on what we do. So to break things down a little bit more, this is a, um, just a, a, a pie chart that breaks down uh, by college the number of faculty members um, or percentage of faculty members in liberal arts and sciences and engineering are the big contributors, but there are also many, many other uh, colleges that contribute. And that's pretty much the way it's been uh, for the last 27 years since 1989. Uh, this is hard to read, and, and I apologize, but these are the 50-some-odd departments. And here, if we look for the big contributors, it would be um, engineering, especially electrical and computer engineering over at the right, uh, psychology over at the left, and mechanical science and engineering, which is the, the light green at the bottom. So again, a pretty, pretty broad group of, of researchers, students, and, and faculty. In terms of the breakdown, we have uh, full -time, what we call full-time, part-time, and affiliates. And the full-time tend to have most of their, if not all of their lab space here, and their students and postdocs, the part-time part of them, and the affiliates, uh, many fewer, but contribute um, and collaborate with people here. And the breakdown is about 50-50 for people that have space here and people that don't. And that fluctuates a little, little bit uh, every so often over the years, certainly. Um, the uh, faculty by research themes, and uh, we'll get into some changes that'll be happening in terms of research themes 
in the near future, uh, but we really have four main themes, and then we uh, create a, another little wedge at the top here called seed proposals that are individuals that haven't been members of the uh, Beckman Institute, but come in and collaborate with people here uh, from a multitude of different departments. And uh, we had, I guess the last seed proposal competition was three years ago, it's probably about three, yeah, 2014, two years ago. Uh, and we certainly hope to have as many as we can. That depends upon uh, resources. Uh, but as we'll see, the Beckman Foundation has become increasingly generous. Um, I worried at first when there were fewer uh, researchers, uh, fewer scientists on the Beckman Foundation than there used to be. Because when Arnold Beckman was alive, and, and even after he was off the board, there were many, many scientists. Many of them were chemists, physicists, biologists, and so forth. There are many fewer scientists. Uh, but that can be a good thing in some ways, because there are lots of bankers and venture capitalists who uh, appreciate science, but know how to invest in, in a much more efficient way than we do. So they've actually grown the endowment. And that's probably one reason that we've been so fortunate. I think there are others. Uh, these are the themes as they exist today, uh, biological intelligence, integrative imaging, human-computer interaction, and molecular and electronic nanostructures. And then we have these, we might call them uh, beginning themes or initiatives that uh, we try out on various topics and spin them off. For example, SDEP, or uh, Social Dimensions of Environmental Policy, uh, run by Jesse Rabot, was spun off after a number of years and now sits within the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. So I think it's fine that we we do that, help to start something and spin it off. This will be the new structure, or is the new structure, but I think of this as fluid too. So a number of months ago, um, actually before, uh, in preparation for the last review we had, which was half the Beckman Institute, or probably a little bit more than half the human computer interaction biological intelligence, a group of faculty from those themes got together and thought about um, how we might update some of the groups and some of the issues uh, uh, that, that are explored. And one of them I thought we should have had many, many years before is the language initiative. Because when you look at the language researchers here, whether from linguistics or psychology or speech and hearing or foreign languages, this place is second to none. So it really was time to come up with a, a theme that focused on language broadly construed across different departments and colleges. But there are a number of others here. And uh, we see this. I think the, the MRT main research theme co-chairs, uh, the group leaders, the faculty uh, who have been involved in this see this as pretty fluid. So I don't see any reason why we can't uh, sunset initiatives uh, that no longer are, um, are uh, topical uh, or no longer have active faculty members and create new ones. And that's what we've tried to do here. So if anybody's interested in these new initiatives that sit under intelligence systems, just let us know. Uh, let Patty know, let Jeff know, and, and so forth. So to move on a, a little bit, we have had a number of reviews, as we often do. In 2013, we had uh, a review of the whole institute and received, as we always do, pretty good feedback from the, from the most part and uh, made some changes as a result of the feedback of the external. We also always have an internal reviewer. And then more recently, it was this past October. And uh, this was, a, I, I thought, a very good uh, review panel. The chair was uh, Deanna Barch. Some of you might know her. She's the department chair in the Department of Psychology at Washington University in St. Louis. And, and uh, having been a department chair who knows how to organize things, she did, she did a great job. And I've never seen the reviews come back as quickly as they did. It was a little over a month, which was remarkable. Uh, she had everybody working uh, t towards the same aim. So we have another review coming up in, uh, in the fall, and that'll be integrative imaging. And that, I believe, is their first review, because they haven't been around all that long. 2017, it'll be MENS, and 2018, uh, uh, external advisory for the whole Beckman Institute again. And the schedule is about every uh, four to five years that we do this. And I think we've, uh, uh, if you're interested in the report, we can always uh, send you the somewhat cleansed report. I won't send you the report uh, that mentions particular names, for better or worse. Um, but I will send you the report that reviews uh, themes and programs. and. Uh, a lot of good uh, suggestions, I think, there uh, in the last couple of reports. Uh, in terms of um, something that happened last year, which was, which was great, we received a $5 million endowment. Uh, so this is different from our Beckman uh, funding every year, which is a current use fund and has to be obligated 
within the course of a year. This is an endowment, and it generates about 4% a year, so figure $200,000 conservatively is what the foundation uh, suggests. And uh, we made a number of proposals, and finally we hit on one that they, they liked, and that was um, to, uh, certainly to honor Ted Brown, but also to honor Ted Brown and, and, and uh, Arnold Beckman, who worked together to get the place off the ground, and I think did a great job. So uh, we have both a Beckman-Brown uh, postdoc, and that's uh, Lydia, who starts this summer. But we'll also have an annual Beckman-Brown uh, lecture, and our first lecturer will be uh, Professor Francis Ar Arnold, and I think the last time I looked, she's a member of all academies, uh, NAE, NAS, and NAM, uh, and is an evolutionary uh, biologist at Caltech. So uh, she has a very interesting background that overlaps with a lot of the things we do here, and she was good enough to, to agree to come. Um, in terms of our postdoctoral fellows, within the Beckman postdoctoral fellows program, we'll see the postdoctoral fellows have expanded in many ways, but these are our new uh, postdoctoral fellows and the departments in which they got, got their degrees. Uh, we also have a number of new centers at the Beckman Institute. Steve Bothpart and his colleagues recently opened a center sponsored by GlaxoSmithKline. So like the Abbott Center, this is another center that's funded through uh, industry money on uh, optical molecular imaging. And this came out of some grants that Steve had with uh, GSK and could become bigger than it is. It's already a nice center, but uh, I think just like Abbott has been, uh, we've been auditioning for five years from Abbott, I think we auditioned for many of these things. And um, Abbott's worked out very well in terms of the basic and translational research, and I think we have to prove ourselves, and that's what we're doing. Uh, we also have a new MURI, a multidisciplinary university research initiative from the Air Force. Uh, that is our new interim director, um, Jeff, as well as Nancy Sotos and Scott White um, and others. And then it looks very good for a renewal of the, the Center for Nutrition, Learning, and Memory funded by Abbott. That was originally a five-year program. It looks like it's going to go on, which is great. And we also have to think about new ways to hand out the money we get. In essence, we've, we've become the granting agency for, for Abbott. I think every corporation is going to be different. They're not like NIH and NSF, where we have a template and we know how to submit grants and we know what's needed. Uh, the way I've always thought of corporations is they're one-offs. Every corporation has its own needs. And we have to make sure our needs uh, are consistent with their needs. And we've done that, I think, very well under the leadership of uh, Keith Garlib from Abbott and Neil Cohen from the University of Illinois as the co-directors of the Abbott Center. So it's funded both animal, human, and computational research. And the idea is to continue that on the topic of nutrition and synergistic effects of nutrition with other lifestyle factors. In terms of the fellows programs, we started, uh, I guess, in thinking about it, we could have done this many years ago. It doesn't cost a lot of money, but we started a new Beckman Institute undergraduates fellows program to allow undergraduates, the really bright ones that are motivated, uh, to come to the Beckman Institute and spend their summers here and to give them enough money so that they can afford rent and they can afford to eat and, and various other things. So we'll have a number of fellows that will be announced and, and receive their awards. Maybe their check, that probably goes into their bank account, but that'll be April 23rd, in which we're going to celebrate a lot of the new fellows. We also have a new program that a number of us worked on, and I, I spent some time at the University of Birmingham, which is a really interesting campus, and learned a lot about UK uh, institutions and how they differ, uh, for better or worse, from the way we uh, configure our uh, universities and medical centers in the United States. But this is a program that started with us, started with the Beckman Institute, and uh, the provost, uh, which is really the chancellor uh, at the University of Birmingham. And uh, Adam and I were able to sit down and sit down with the faculty members and uh, start with a number of uh, overlapping interest areas and the two that Beckman will focus on. Others are uh, possibly will be uh, focus areas for IGB and then also for the humanities and social sciences. But our two will be cognition and aging and brain trauma. And brain trauma is an interesting one because they have a huge hospital at the University of Birmingham. If you take the train out of the city, you walk one way to the right and you go to Queen Elizabeth's. That's the hospital. You walk the other way, you go to the university. So they're very, very close, right? The train tracks separate them. 
And Queen Elizabeth's is an interesting hospital. It really is the hospital that, that people go to in a six million uh, person catchment area. So it's a huge, huge hospital that is very, very interested in research. In fact, they built a translational research institute that's connected to the hospital with the hallway where you can wheel patients in who are undergoing various procedures and essentially do research in, uh, on them with full nursing staff and everything else. So it's really a, a wonderful situation. And we hit it off very well with Tony Belly. And Tony is the head of neural trauma at Queen Elizabeth. It's also interesting because hospitals in the UK, and especially Queen Elizabeth's, are not military or civilian. They're military and civilian. So I met a number of mil military surgeons and docs. And, and uh, Tony is the head of all neurosurgery there and, and really got very interested in some of the things that were going on here, has come to visit us, and, and uh, that will be one of the, uh, the fellows. Another interesting aspect of the Bridge, Birmingham, uh, Illinois, or Beckman uh, Fellows Program is that once these fellows finish their three years, and they'll spend about from a year to year and a half here, and about the same amount of time at the University of Birmingham, if they've done well, and most of them do, um, they're given a tenure-track faculty position. So boy, that's a, a nice carrot at the end of the, the road for the fellows program. And we're starting with a few of them here, and, and Birmingham is also paying most of the money that it costs. We're paying a smaller amount. We also have another fellowship program with Carl Hospital, and we've had uh, Carl Clinic when we've had fellowships in the past, and this one is focused on MRI and applications to neurology. Uh, finally, as, as I talked about, we have the Beckman Brown Postdoctoral Fellow, so that's an addition to our fellows program, and uh, the Carl Summer Undergraduate Research Fellows, which is another new program. So we've really brought in at multiple levels, a number of new fellows and a number of new programs, and also scholarships uh, like the Nadine Barry Smith uh, program for women in science and engineering, uh, like the Hafferkamp program, uh, like the Janssen family program. So we've been working for the last uh, six years in bringing scholarship money, both current use funds and endowments, they're, they're both, and the Huang Fellowship, uh, sponsored by Tom Wong's students and Tom Wong's uh, children and also Tom. So I, I think we've, we've done great, and I, I look forward to coming back and, and seeing all the additional new fellows that we have, because I think it's a fantastic program. In terms of research facilities, we often do our updates. Um, some of the money we get from the Beckman Foundation, the current use money that we're required to obligate and, and do our best to spend every year, goes to our fellows program, both graduate students, um, postdocs, and the undergraduates, which again is pretty inexpensive, uh, that program, but also to update centralized shared facilities. And these are, um, uh, some of these facilities are updated also by grants, and it's really a combination of Beckman Foundation money, which has allowed us to keep very current. For example, I guess as of what, next week, or is it this week, uh, we're spending $2 million upgrading the two MRI machines so we don't have to buy uh, new MRI machines. And I do know exactly what a Prisma costs. It's about $4 million with all the bells and whistles. And for $2 million, we can upgrade both of our current machines to be equivalent to this new $4 million or $8 million worth of machines. So I think it's a, it's a great deal in the, in the state, state of the art. Uh, some of you may know about this, but many uh, probably not, but there's a program on campus that's gradually going through classroom buildings and research buildings. It's called ESCO. It's an energy savings program that was sponsored with state money and money that others have been able to collect and we've been able to collect some money. Uh, and it's all about energy conservation. Um, in our case, uh, it'll, um, the goal is certainly to re reduce energy use and Earl Hefley has been looking into this and the proposals that have been made uh, by a number of companies that are uh, bidding on this are pretty dramatic in terms of energy savings. But in addition to that, we will be able to upgrade our wet lab capacity, that is our, our fume hoods. Um, and, and it's interesting, I think when we first built the Beckman Institute, you know, you do your best to guesstimate uh, what you'll need in 20 years from now or 25 years from when you put up a building. But I think you often underestimate, and we did. And since we need to make our space flexible, for both dry labs and wet labs, biosafety level two labs that have different requirements for HVAC or ventilation and so forth. It's hard to predict. So it's time actually for our, us to update our HVAC. And through various means, we were able to put aside through the help of the OVCR and, the, and our uh, Beckman Institute that we were able to save money, we were able to put away about $3 million uh, so that we can make the Beckman Institute usable for the next 25 years. And I think you really do need to keep on top of these things. 
I never thought I'd learn uh, what I have about HVAC and other things, but plumbing and leaking steam pipes. And, but you know, the building looks great on the outside. I still think it looks like a wonderful building. But as uh, Rob Fritz and Vince and Earl can tell you, not always so good in the guts of the building. There are things that really need repairs and replacements. And being a very large science building, nothing is cheap here. So we spend hundreds of thousands a year just maintaining. And then it's time occasionally to build capacity to make sure that the building is usable for another 25 years. So we've been doing that. Uh, we've also been remodeling the microscopy suite to cite new instruments, such as uh, those that I've shown you. Uh, cell phone coverage, it seems like a simple thing, but it doesn't work well when there's a lot of concrete and metal, and make that's the basement. And we do have patients and others come into the MRI suite in the basement, so it's, it would be a good idea to always have contact with the outside world. We've been working on that. Uh, Earl Hefley and Rob have also been working on hoteling and hot desking as a way to expand our capacity for individuals that might come in to visit, whether they're graduate students or postdocs or uh, faculty uh, member uh, visitors, so that we can allocate space on a temporary basis and you can even schedule it using, a, I think it's an Android tablet or an iPad uh, kind of um, interface. Uh, we've also upgraded, it was time to upgrade the capacity here in the auditorium and we can mirror everything across the hall in, in uh, 10.05, so all of the electronics and optics and everything else have been ripped out and, and redone here again so that the building is state of the art for many years. Now, in terms of challenges, we all have them. And last year we took a 9% uh, cut. Uh, the cuts really ranged. Um, the departments tended to be smaller, but even among departments, the cuts ranged pretty dramatically. Uh, the lowest I've heard was 3%, and the highest departmental cut was what we got, 9%. The institutes in general had 9% cuts, and for us that was $382,000 that comes to us every year. That's a lot of money. And uh, I can't say we were, we were all thinking about these cuts in the past. I guess we all kind of knew that states aren't quite funding higher ed, uh, public higher ed the way they used to, uh, but now the reality has hit home, and uh, we've had to adjust things there. We've also been told for this year, the funds we received, the 91% of the state funds that we received, we might have to give back from half a million to one million. We don't know about that yet. Uh, I was talking to Brian Ross, who's the interim uh, uh, dean of LAS, and uh, I guess maybe he was trying to make me feel good, I don't know, or make himself not feel as bad, but he said, oh, your cut's a million, mine's 40. 40 million dollars is one quarter of the budget for LAS that the state provides. So we're, we're all working hard to try to minimize damage uh, in thinking about these things. That would be a one-time uh, one cut or rescission give back. Uh, for uh, fiscal year 17, I actually hope we have a 16 budget, but uh, it's looking increasingly like, like we may not. Uh, but the cuts there we've been told to plan for, and we have provided our spreadsheets to central campus, uh, range up to 7%. So they're substantial. And I, and I think what this suggests, and I think this, uh, and this is across the board, not just for research institutes, but for departments and all the entities we think are important and we need to maintain at universities, is that we really need to think about diversifying. And I don't know that we can, I mean, it would be nice to believe the state is going to give us a big chunk of money. Um, I was talking to somebody at, at Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh, the other day, and he said, well, our st we only had two states up until two weeks ago that hadn't had a state budget for fiscal year 16, and Pennsylvania was the other one. Uh, but not only did they get a state budget two weeks ago, the university's got a 5% increment. That would be great <laughs> if we got that, but I'm not planning for that. And I think we have to plan to, and think about what other kinds of resources we have that we can apply to the things that are important to us. And one of the impacts from last year was the closure of one of our centralized uh, facilities uh, whose, whose use had declined, and that's one way to look at what might be closed, is the Illinois Simulator Lab. And sad for me, I helped to build that, and sad also because the people there are great. So good news, there is good news. Uh, there's always good news. And this is our profile in terms of uh, grant funding over the years. Uh, 2012 was kind of an outlier, that's when Abbott started, and they, I believe they paid about 14 million in new grants the first year, which is an awful lot of money. It'd be great to do that again, and, again, and I think that's a great goal. But over the years, we, we bounced around a bit, but if we went back further, which we don't do here, you'd see that even the last five years have gone up quite substantially compared to the five years prior to that. And this year is up, we're, we're only partially through the year, but it's already up compared to the previous year. 
Uh, in terms of grant expenditures, they tend to lag uh, the grants, and uh, this is our expenditure pattern over the last uh, number of years. Um, good news in terms of gift funding, and the blue bar is the Beckman Foundation. And as I'd mentioned, uh, I guess we need more bankers and venture capitalists because they do know how to invest. Uh, and the amount of money to invest is about three quarters of a billion dollars that exists within the Beckman Foundation. Uh, what is it, the 1099? I can't remember the federal form. K99, so you can look it up. It's, uh, they, they file their taxes every year like we do, and you can look up exactly how they've invested and exactly how much they've paid to invest, and you'd be surprised at how much people pay to invest, but you know, I guess you get what you pay for. And the money uh, in the foundation has gone up, the endowment, and as a result of the reports we do every year, which is based on the work all of you do, so if you weren't doing good work, if we weren't publishing and good journals and, and being successful with external funding, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't have gotten these increases. We also get small amounts of money, and these are for some of the scholarships and fellowships and a variety of other uh, small amounts of money. I think in the future, it makes sense for us to continue to, to raise uh, money from other sources, and we're working on several now that I can't tell you about, but um, Jeff will work with Patty and Kara and some of you on, on those possibilities. So we do have other possibilities. So I think in terms of Beckman, why are we successful despite the, the, the challenging financial times? We were one of the first interdisciplinary uh, institutes. Many interdisciplinary institutes that have subsequently arisen are really based on what we do. I remember talking to the former chancellor of the University of Wisconsin who was the founding director of the Discovery Institutes, uh, which is a beautiful building uh, sitting on the, on the north side or south side of the University of Wisconsin campus. Uh, but he had told me he visited here several times. And we've had visitors from Virginia Tech, visitors from many universities who have subsequently built interdisciplinary institutes. Um, we, we have a great staff. Uh, the campus administration is supportive. So uh, I wish I could tell you to go to the town hall meetings for the chancellor candidates, but there won't be town hall meetings. But uh, you can provide input to Antoinette Burton, who is the chair of the committee, and I think it's important that the next chancellor be uh, very broad-minded, um, realize the value of both departments and colleges, but also the institutes that bring together faculty from departments and colleges. So it's up to you to make that point. Uh, candidates have not been invited yet, but they will be soon. Uh, the future. Uh, I think we are well situated. Um, and, and you can argue either way whether we should um, pursue additional uh, corporate funding. I think if it's done carefully and the corporations do not micromanage what the faculty and the students have a passion about, and that's been the case with Abbott, and I'm sure it'll be the case with GlaxoSmithKline, I think those relationships can work well. I think we have to carefully craft them, and we do, and we have good uh, legal staff uh, at, at the University of Illinois that helps us do that, as well as Melanie Lutz, who's sitting in the back in the OVCR uh, office. Uh, we do have good momentum over the years. I think we've done well in continuing to build the institute despite the declining funding uh, from the state. We're not unique there. I, I, I wish we were. We, we were an outlier, and there would be uh, but many states have provided decline, declining funding to uh, universities. Uh, so I think we're well positioned, and uh, it's been a privilege to be here for the last 27 years. I, I got here uh, in 1989 when the doors opened, and uh, I never thought I'd be here this long either, uh, either on campus or at the Beckman Institute, but it's been a great place to spend a lot of time, and all of you uh, have made it a great place, so thank you. That's it. I'm open for questions. <laughs> questions, comments, criticisms, I, I accept all of the above. As I told Melanie, it, it's not worth firing me now because I'll be gone in two weeks, so <laughs> shoot. <laughs> no, nobody has any questions? Martha, you look like you have a question. <laughs> I don't have a question. I wouldn't bring up now. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Okay. So you don't want, want to get me fired today, maybe tomorrow. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Anybody else? I, don't, I didn't mean to pick on Martha. She was just looking like she wanted to ask me a question. 
Martha is one of our new faculty members, and I think the great place about the, fac uh, the, the Beckman Institute, she's been an affiliate here for many years, but she's really increased, sorry to embarrass you, but uh, she's increased her presence here on many, many collaborations through the Obama Brain Initiative with colleagues uh, Rohit and John Swedler. And, and I, I think that's the great, uh, one great aspect of the Beckman Institute. You can be a junior faculty member, uh, a uh, intermediate uh, associate professor, or a very seasoned faculty member and still find a home in the Beckman Institute. Uh, Sue Chance is somebody else who, who joined us, who's sitting right there. Sorry. I guess you too. And I didn't even see you. I just, it just came to me. So I see you now. So I, I think it's possible. And, and if you have colleagues that you think should be in the Beckman Institute, please bring them to Patty and Jeff, because we really want to support interdisciplinary research. And we're all here because we have a passion to do things that go way beyond what we learned how to do. So I'm not going to say Martha doesn't know what she's doing. Maybe I don't know what I'm doing. But, but I've been fortunate enough to be able to collaborate with people from many departments that I never would have thought I'd have the opportunity to collaborate with. And one of, the, one of the things for me is that it's, it's great to be both a professor and a student simultaneously. So in all my time here, I've gotten to learn many new things. Uh, and I think that's what's so great about the Beckman Institute. You can find somebody who, who knows pretty much anything you want to know here. And if not, go over to IGB or NCSA, and you'll find other people there. Anybody else? This is much too easy. I was expecting, <laughs> I was expecting hard questions. OK, you're being nice to me because I'm old and leaving or something? <laughs> oh, okay. Yes? OK, well, Jeff's not here, but if, if Jeff was here, what advice would you give him? Yeah, we've been working on that. And uh, <laughs> I, I, no, 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 Jeff, Jeff has asked me for some advice, as I ask people, and I still do. My go-to guy is Ted Brown. And you know, Ted may be in his late 80s, but I, I can't see him, of, uh, and I study aging, as you do. I don't see the man has lost a step. So I think all of the previous directors and department heads and deans have great advice about how to handle different kinds of issues. And um, I, I think what I tell Jeff is, and what I've told Jeff is, you have a fantastic staff, you have great faculty members, don't micromanage them, but listen to them and uh, pay attention to what they have to say. They're going to come up with great ideas, just like the, um, the new theme. I think there's a lot of great ideas that come out of here. And directors are here to support the faculty and the students. And I think as long as we remember it's not about us, it's about the institute, and it's about the University of Illinois, every director will do fine. And Jeff's a pretty laid back, uh, very even temperament guy, so I think he's going to do fine, but also a great scientist. So. Gary. So what's the time frame for then for having uh, a non-interim Beckman director? Yeah, right. So uh, the OVCR's office will be starting a search. Uh, Melanie can speak to it. I think by the end of the summer is probably when the search will start. And then uh, the plan is to have somebody here when you can get them, with, but by next year at the latest. Is that true? That's true. You know, I think we will get it. Okay, good. Yeah. And it will be, as all searches have been for the Beckman director, a national search. And uh, of course, people uh, that are interested in applying from University of Illinois should do so. But there will also be other people applying. Um, so it will be interesting to see. And, and this will be a transparent search uh, where the finalist candidates will do a town hall. So you'll get to ask them whatever questions you think are important. Uh, you know, years ago, when, when Ted and Jerry and even when Pierre uh, we'll see us were directors. There weren't a lot of people that had interdisciplinary experience in these kinds of institutes. But these days, there's more and more. So uh, there'll probably be a good group of people to select among. And uh, I don't know who the chair will be, but whoever that is, uh, talk to him or her and uh, let them know what you think about each of the candidates, because this will be a transparent process in terms of interviewing them and uh, have town hall meetings and so forth, which I think is important. Anybody else? Have a good afternoon. Thanks.